Animals are roaming the streets in a town evacuated since the Fukushima nuclear disaster. They seem intent on taking over the deserted community. March 11, 2011. A mega quake triggered a monster tsunami in northeastern Japan. The disaster disabled one of the largest nuclear power plants in the world, Fukushima Daiichi. 3 of the plant's reactors melted down, releasing vast amounts of radioactive material into the environment. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, run by Tokyo Electric Power Company, is located some 230 kilometers northeast of Tokyo. A 20 kilometer radius area was declared an evacuation zone forcing around 90,000 people to leave their homes. In Fukushima, residents are supposed to return to their homes once radiation levels fall. However, the proliferation of wildlife could make going back a challenge. The forests remain heavily contaminated by radioactive particles. There are hotspots with more than 100 microsieverts per hour, shown in red by this special camera. Are the flora and fauna living in the forests being impacted by the radiation? Scientists photographed specimens with a special film that reacts to radioactivity. Everything in black shows contamination. We realize that this is the same what we saw in Chernobyl. And here in Fukushima, we are just at the beginning stage. Five years after Japan's nuclear disaster, we take a close look at how radiation has affected the wildlife. This is the coastline along the evacuation zone. The scars of the tsunami still remain. The recovery work has been slowed by the radioactive contamination. An elementary school comes into view, but the distinctive sounds of children cannot be heard. Next to the residential area is a forest. It's a radioactive forest. The radiation dose is around 10 microsieverts per hour. That's 250 times the natural radiation measured in Tokyo. This map shows the radiation dose recorded by airplanes and other means three months after the nuclear accident. Red represents locations with annual exposure levels equivalent to 100 millisieverts. Very high levels of contamination have spread widely. But over time, the radiation dose has gradually decreased. On average, the radiation dose has fallen by 65% compared to what it was five years ago. Still, the levels remain fairly high. The forested areas begin about 10 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant.
some scientists have been investigating the situation in the forest on a regular basis ever since the accident. One scientist involved in these investigations is Satoshi Mori. Mori and his team use a special camera that can show a visualization of the radiation dose. The areas with the highest levels appear in red. It's clear the amount of radiation near the ground is particularly high. Hot spots with exceptionally high levels of radiation are scattered throughout the forest. This road goes through the forest. The small depression beside the road is a hot spot. The researchers believe radioactive material brought by rain accumulated in the depression. A dosimeter reads 110 microsieverts per hour. For the first time, they find a super hot spot that couldn't be detected by air surveillance or other means. A trail camera set up there filmed these wild boars. They're eating the roots of grass. These hotspots are believed to be one of the causes of the contamination of wild animals. Mori is investigating the actual condition of the flora and fauna in the radioactive forest. He photographed plants and animals with special film that reacts to radiation. These images start to give a clear picture of contamination inside wildlife. In the autumn of 2015, Mori compared bark taken from a cedar tree in the town of Namie in Fukushima to similar bark collected far away in the city of Fukuoka in southwestern Japan. Black spots and shadows appear only in the photographs of the Namie samples. The radioactive particles that fell in the forest still remain on the tree bark. On these cedar leaves, Shadows and spots appear in the shape of the leaves and the branch. This indicates flora absorb the radioactive matter, mistaking it for nutrients. The chemical properties of radioactive cesium are similar to those of the nutrient potassium, so plants absorb cesium easily. Mori also investigated insects and animals. Their bodies have taken in radioactive matter too. This is the first time the contamination of such a large number of flora and fauna has been investigated in a follow-up study in the wake of a nuclear accident. It's important to record data on the state of plants, animals, and microorganisms, everything. By collecting this information and analyzing it, we will eventually know more about the effects. This may sound inappropriate, but it's like a large experiment site for radioactive contamination.
The question is, what kind of effect the radioactive contamination is having on the flora and fauna in the forests? A research team from Hirosaki University started studying the radioactive forest six months after the nuclear disaster. The leader of the team is Tomisato Miura, a specialist in cellular genetics. Team members push their way into the forest, hoping to capture a particular animal. It's a field mouse. The radiation dose on the forest floor is still high. The mice live here, so they were likely exposed to high doses of radiation. Tree nuts are also contaminated. The mice eat these, and therefore they are internally exposed to radiation too. Miura believes the field mice are likely to be easily affected by radiation. There are many things we don't know about whether these levels of radiation are harmful to the body. We think we can look into it a little deeper to find out whether there have been effects by examining these animals at the cellular level. Miura is focusing on the chromosomes that transmit the animal's genetic information. Radiation sometimes divides and deforms chromosomes. Miura is trying to figure out whether the number of these kinds of chromosomes is increasing or not. Mice have 48 chromosomes in each cell. Finding abnormal ones is very laborious work. Two chromosomes in this cell were found to be abnormal. Both had been separated. So far, Miura has extracted and studied some 3,400 cells from the mice collected from Namie. He compared them to the cells of mice taken from the city of Hirosaki in Aomori Prefecture, northern Japan, which was not contaminated. The incidence of abnormality for the mice from Namie was 0.1%. In those from Hirosaki, it was 0.2%. Statistically, there was no difference. In other words, despite the fact they were exposed to a high level of radiation, there doesn't seem to be any genetic damage in the Namie mice. However, in order to state definitively that the mice have received no impact, Miura believes he will need to analyze tens of thousands of more cells. It's absolutely necessary to look at many more cells to make a firm determination. It will be important to present to everyone a tight, evidence-based study so that they can know whether there has been any impact or not. In small towns next to the forest, farm fields are being overrun with vegetation and swallowed up by the woodlands. All human activity here has been suspended because of the nuclear accident, causing drastic changes to the ecosystem. Many animals and birds, normally fond of the mountains and grasslands, have begun to appear in what was human habitat.
This is the center of the town of Namie. Decontamination work has been carried out. And as a result, the radiation dose has fallen to less than one microsievert per hour. Weeds are creeping up, encroaching upon ruined residences. There are about 40,000 abandoned houses and other buildings throughout the entire evacuation zone. They're becoming homes for wild animals. Former residents who want to clean up their homes must first receive permission from the local government. And even when they can return, they're only allowed to be in their homes during the day. They're facing a daunting reality. <laughs> Wild animals have caused a fair bit of damage. This resident returns to his home to clean it up about once a month. Each time, he finds that wild animals have caused further damage. He's vowed to return to live in his home once the radiation dose falls. But he's finding the constant damage by the animals disheartening. What kinds of animals are settling into these houses? For the past two years, Kei Okuda and his team have been investigating these wild animals. With the permission of residents, he set up trail cameras in abandoned houses. Coming out from under the floor is a group of raccoons. Originally from North America, raccoons were brought into Japan as pets, but they ended up in the wild. The opening is only about 10 centimeters wide, but it's no problem for the raccoons. They slide in and out easily, one by one. The raccoons are using the space above the ceiling as a sleeping area. Masked palm civets have moved in too. These animals normally bed down in dark places, such as hollows in the trunks of trees or caves. These vacated houses are serving as good substitutes. Analysis of video taken by cameras set up in various places found that there was one location where raccoons were filmed 700 times over a five-month period. It's possible raccoons carry infectious diseases that can be transmitted to humans, although this hasn't been confirmed yet in this area. These vacated houses have been left untouched, and now they have become habitats for wild animals. 
With the absence of people, the density of these animal populations has increased. One large animal is rapidly increasing in numbers in the evacuation zone. The wild boar. Wild boars normally live in the mountains, and they are very cautious creatures. They usually never show themselves in front of humans. But now, in these deserted towns, wild boars have begun to appear even in broad daylight. Some are rearing offspring here. There's a family of wild boars right in the middle of a residential area. This house that has weathered the elements is a perfect sanctuary for the wild boars. These wild boars that have settled in the town are wary of people. Altogether, there are 11 of them. It's a large family you wouldn't normally see in the mountains. Their numbers have increased dramatically. Wild boars would usually live in the hills and mountains, so how are they getting on in this town? Scientists started looking for answers a couple of years ago. Leading the investigation is veterinarian Toshio Mizoguchi, who has studied ways to deal with wild animals for more than 30 years. He uses anesthesia to put a wild boar to sleep. Mizoguchi is carrying out his present study using, for the first time, a sub-miniature camera developed by NHK. Local hunters help him attach the camera to the wild boar's body. They return the boar to the field after giving it nutrients intravenously. It will be the first attempt to analyze the behavior of wild boars and understand how their way of life has changed. The camera captured this video. The animal appears to have joined up with its companions. It's one of six boars in the group. They're crossing a stream that runs along a road. They climb a slope and come to a clearing, which used to be a rice field.
They're looking for unharvested persimmons. The point of view video shows that the wild boars come here every day. The sub-miniature camera also records rarely seen behavior of the normally cautious wild boars. A man is in the direction they're headed. It's one of the decontamination workers who come into the evacuation zone only during the daytime. The wild boars give no indication they're going to run away from him. Indeed, they're coming nearer to the man. And in the end, the human is the one who gives way to the boar. The normal relationship humans have with wild animals has been reversed. This boar is about one year old. The cameraman tries to scare it away but it's already completely unafraid of people. Local hunters regularly go out in the evacuation zone. Since the nuclear accident, they've terminated about 9,500 wild boars. But there are no signs that the numbers of wild boars are decreasing. Since the wild boars believe this is their habitat, the situation will not change unless more pressure is put on them. Wild boars won't go back to the mountains even when people return. Five years of human absence has greatly changed the way of life for these wild animals. There's a place that provides hints about the impact of the radioactive contamination. The world's worst nuclear accident happened here in Chernobyl in 1986. Even now, 
There are spots where the radiation dose reaches nearly 200 microsieverts per hour. Scientists have carried out various studies of flora and fauna in the forests around Chernobyl. The studies are a valuable reference when compared with the contaminated areas of Fukushima. Some clear abnormalities have been confirmed in Scott's Pines in Chernobyl. Normally, the trees grow straight up, but these are extending out sideways. Some of the branches are heavily twisted. It's believed the effects of radiation caused these irregularities. The results of studies show that the incidence of abnormalities in trees in uncontaminated areas is 6%. But as the radiation dose gets higher, there's a tendency for the incidence of abnormalities to be higher as well. Some reports show abnormalities that may be linked to the effects of radiation in animals. Swallows are one of these cases. Timothy Mosso is a leading researcher on the biological consequences of the Chernobyl accident. Yeah, they were supposed to close the With the permission of local authorities, he has caught and studied swallows that come here to breed. Abnormalities are found in the swallow's tail feathers. The lengths of both ends are different, throwing off the balance of the feathers. Mousseau believes their survival could be compromised because it's harder for them to fly in a stable way. Mousseau has measured 3,000 swallows. Those from uncontaminated areas show a difference, on average, of 1.9 millimeters in the length of their tail feathers. In Chernobyl, the difference is 4.9 millimeters. Mousseau also analyzed the bird's sperm to investigate their breeding capabilities. This is the sperm from a swallow taken near Chernobyl. The spermatozoa circled in red are hardly moving. These abnormal spermatozoa make up, on average, 21.7% of all sperm cells. That's eight times the ratio for swallows from uncontaminated areas. And then we noticed that the male birds uh, had uh, reduced fertility. The, uh, the sperm was more deformed in many of the birds. Up to 40% of the swallow birds had uh, uh, sperm that were uh, deformed or broken in some way. They do seem to be uh, very much uh, the canary in the coal mine in terms of a, a very good indicator uh, of, of radiation in the environment. Mousseau has visited evacuation zones in Fukushima in Japan every year since the nuclear accident. He wants to compare the condition of the swallows with the abnormalities seen at Chernobyl. In Fukushima, he has found some birds that have differing tail feather lengths. The lengths of the left and right tail feathers of this swallow are different. However, in Japan, there are few researchers who are capturing and studying swallows. As a result, not enough data is being collected to conclude whether abnormalities are occurring or not. But evidence that radioactive materials are contaminating swallows has been found.
450 becquerels of cesium per kilogram were detected from the remains of a swallow found in the evacuation zone. A photograph taken with film that highlights radiation shows dark shadows in the bird's internal organs. The swallow was likely contaminated by the insects and other food it ate. There has not been sufficient study done here yet to determine whether those same sorts of outcomes will, will happen here. Uh, so hopefully there will be more studies to determine what the long-term consequences are. Uh, but at the moment we don't know. Comparative studies are starting in Japan on the Japanese red pine, which is a close relative of the Scots pine, the tree that shows abnormalities in Chernobyl. Vassil Yoshenko has been studying plants in Chernobyl. He's investigating an area in Fukushima that used to be pasture land. During the past five years, it has turned into wasteland, and many pine trees began growing here. Now this is uh, some branches, but uh, there is no main trunk. For Scots pine, we uh, collected a lot of results, like uh, more than 1,000 trees. We realized that this is the same what we saw in Chernobyl. For a normal pine tree, the trunk is in the middle and grows straight up. This abnormal tree has no main trunk, and the branches are growing out radially, similar to what has been observed in Chernobyl. Six point seven. In this area, the meter reading is about 7 microsieverts per hour. Approximately 40% of the pine trees here display abnormalities. This graph shows the incidence of abnormalities in Chernobyl. The results of investigations at seven locations in Fukushima Prefecture are plotted in red. Like at Chernobyl, the incidence of abnormalities tends to be high in areas where the radiation dose is elevated. So, we can see that uh, pine, Japanese red pine, is radiosensitive. Radiosensitive means that uh, radiation creates some effects, some impacts to these trees. And here in Fukushima, we are just at the beginning stage. And this is a very good stage for, for research to see everything in dynamics. In Fukushima, more than 20 research teams are studying various organisms. Some have reported finding abnormalities. However, at this point in time, they can't conclude that an increase in radiation exposure is the cause. And so studies continue on biological life in Fukushima designed to make comparisons to the extensive data from Chernobyl. One animal living in the contaminated zone in Fukushima is attracting worldwide attention. It's the Japanese macaque, a member of the primate order which includes humans. No primates inhabit the areas around Chernobyl. This is the first time in the world that primates living in the wild have been exposed to radiation from a nuclear accident. These macaque monkeys live around mountain towns. They eat contaminated food, which gradually increases their internal exposure to radiation. Manabu Fukumoto studies the impact of radiation in monkeys. He 
he's measuring the thigh muscles of monkeys. The muscles easily accumulate radioactive cesium. The measurements show 13,000 becquerels per kilogram. It's a very high reading. Of course, we'll never see this level of exposure in humans. What we really want to know is if there are any changes when a primate monkey receives this kind of exposure. The targets of Fukumoto's study are monkeys in the evacuation zone and those living nearby. The specimens have been collected from monkeys put down because of the damage they caused to humans. The research on the monkeys began in 2013. Today, Fukumoto and his team are measuring the 229th sample. They are doing detailed analyses of more than 20 kinds of organs and tissues, including the thyroid. At this point, Fukumoto is focusing on one part of the monkey's body. It's bone marrow, which produces red and white blood cells. This is the bone marrow from a macaque captured in January 2014. There are almost no cells producing blood cells. The marrow is essentially made up of a whitish looking fat. A comparison with normal bone marrow shows a clear difference. It's almost all fat. There are few blood-producing cells. This isn't normal. This graph shows the results of detailed analyses of nine adult monkeys. A straight-line correlation was drawn based on a statistical analysis of the data. When the concentration of cesium was higher, there tended to be fewer white blood cell producing cells. The number of samples is still small. And at present, Fukumoto says he cannot determine if this is because of the impact of radiation exposure or not. In addition, this tendency has not yet been observed among young monkeys. We are looking for signs of aplastic anemia. It's a precancerous stage. This stage can develop into leukemia. However, aplastic anemia does not necessarily lead to cancer. Moreover, abnormalities in the blood itself, resulting in diseases like leukemia, have not been detected in the monkeys. But Fukumoto believes scientists should not overlook such symptoms, and that analysis should be continued for decades. He's learned from the past. Years ago, he found actual proof of a case in which radioactive materials had an impact, but took a long time to appear. Up until the 1950s, Thorotrast was used as an angiographic agent for X-rays. Many people developed cancer because of the radioactive material that was contained in it. But the onset of the disease didn't occur until more than 20 years after the administration of Thorotrast. In the case of the monkeys, it is possible there will be a long incubation period until the consequences of the radiation exposure surface. There is no guarantee that the effects will not appear in 20 or 30 years' time. It's 
very important to look at it from a long time frame and wide perspective. We have to carry out the examinations very carefully so we do not overlook any small changes. Japan's nuclear disaster has created a vast expanse without humans. The Japanese government is gradually lifting evacuation orders for areas showing annual radiation exposure of less than 20 millisieverts. It's a different option than that taken for Chernobyl, where basically no one is allowed to return. The government decided to lift the evacuation order for this area in July 2016. Koichi Nemoto is preparing to return to his home. He's been urged to take specific measures to protect himself from wild animals. He's put an electric fence around his house and barn to keep animals out. Wild boars don't run away at all. They look at me like I'm a visitor. It's like they're the owners and I'm the guest. Wild animals that normally live in nature have taken over our world. I wonder if we are the ones now living in a cage. In the end, that's what's happened, right? Nemoto has taken on the job of cutting down weeds that have taken over large rice fields, hoping to slow down the land falling to waste. Cutting the weeds also reduces the areas where wild boars and other wildlife can lurk. Nemoto and others are just starting out on the long and hard road toward taking back their town from the animals. nuclear accident caused a great deal of radioactive contamination, tearing apart the peaceful life of the locals. But ironically, this has led to the proliferation of wild animals. Five years on, and the radioactive forests are still gripped by this absurd paradox.